Good morning, everyone. This is um, slightly surreal for me because I can simply see my own computer screen, um, and I'll have to assume you're all there. So I've been asked to present um, a summary of, of what we've been doing in the QUT Proof 5 group for the last 10 years, and it's to some extent a very personal summary. It's a reflection not on any one particular project, but largely a reflection of what the CRC, uh, both the current CRC and its forerunner, the CRC for National Plant Biosecurity, has been able to achieve through consistency of long-term funding. Um, it's quite an important issue, I believe, that we're uh, potentially looking at a problem with the um, as the CRC winds up. So how do we get that continuity of funding? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. I can't. So just a very brief background. Anyone who's been through more than one science exchange knows fruit flies, but I just need to set the scene. So fruit flies are the major biosecurity threats to horticulture in most parts of the world. Um, just some big numbers. Uh, Queensland fruit fly, uh, rubbery figures, but approximately $100 million per year to Australia. Harder figures, um, the invasion of Bacteria dorsalis into Africa, uh, first detected in 2003, but have probably been there for um, two years, probably prior to that. It's estimated between 2003 and 2016 to have cost more than $2 billion to Africa simply in lost markets. Uh, there's no direct cost of production, nothing else. That's just lost market opportunity. So these animals can cause very significant damage. Next slide, please. So Australia, Australia suffers from both endemic fruit fly pests, Queensland fruit fly, Jarvis's fruit fly, lesser Queensland fruit fly. We have permanently established exotic flies, which med fly is the best known, but mango fly, Bacteria ferrum feldi, is another one. And then we're permanently challenged by offshore threats. Oriental fruit fly, melon fly, these occur permanently established in our near northern neighbours, but we don't have them yet. So these fruit flies impact on border protection, crop production and market access. Next slide, please. So given the importance of fruit flies, it's not surprising that the CRC National Plant Biosecurity and the Plant Biosecurity CRC invested heavily in fruit flies. The portfolio of the CRCs covered pretty much every aspect of fruit flies, from systematics and diagnostics. Um, I'm assuming Mark presented um, on behalf of this project earlier. Surveillance and trapping, in-field control, post-harvest treatments, knowledge collation, and national and international leadership. The QUT did not participate in all of those by any means, but that was the portfolio of research that's been funded over the last 10 years by the CRC and its forerunner in fruit fly research. Next slide, please. So focusing just on QUT and my lab in particular, so this does not um, reflect funding to other groups um, at QUT, but primarily the QUT fruit fly group. Between 2008 and 2018, QUT was the recipient of fruit fly funding worth to us approximately $2.8 million. The funding that went to partners and other uh, as part of larger projects. And it deals with quite a number, as you'll see, um, a number of projects over that 10 year period. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize with this slide is that's pretty accurate. Um, I've gone to a fair bit of trouble to work out what the total value of our projects were. And while that's a nice healthy figure, um, it's less in terms of dollar funding, <coughs> excuse me, than just one project that I've been associated with externally from the CRC in the last 18 months. And I'm going to turn my camera on and off again. I will do that. <clears throat> I'm 
Excuse me. Okay. Um, so it, it's consistent funding, but on a per yearly basis, it's not a staggering amount. And before going any further, I need to acknowledge those partners that we've worked with. Over the last decade, the QUT Lab has been able to work with a large number of partners, both Australian domestic partners, international partners, um, Lincoln University in New Zealand. We've worked with industry groups, with Hort Innovation via the CRC. And I acknowledge there particularly the management teams of the current CRC and its forerunner. I think the management teams at CRC headquarters don't necessarily get acknowledged enough in projects, um, but there's no doubt um, that in my projects, in some cases, the management team have been a core part of the project itself, and in others, there's no doubt that the leadership and direction provided by the management team has been important to the project. So what I'm talking about here is not done in isolation. But coming back to QUT and fruit fly funding, do I believe that this long-term investment has been worthwhile? And the answer is emphatically, yes, I do. And the next few slides, I'm going to um, give examples of why I think that's the case in terms of outcomes, impacts, and quality of science. And then focus on capacity development in international linkages and leadership. So these last three are less tangibles um, when it comes to reporting on a project, but the outcomes of 10 years worth of funding, really significant part of what CRCs are meant to be doing. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So what are the science outcomes that we've achieved? We've resolved the status of key pest species in the Bacteria dorsalis species complex. This was a problem which had been going on for 20 years uh, without resolution. In fact, uh, sometimes quite acrimonious debate. We provided novel insights into how, where and why Queensland fruit fly forages for protein, the project that was specifically targeted at improving protein bait spray controls. Through Paul Cunningham's work and a prior project before that, we've significantly advanced in developing a novel um, lure for mature Queensland fruit flies. And through Mark's most recent project, and again, a project prior to that one, we've developed a new generation for national fruit fly diagnostic standards. Next slide, please. What are the impacts of that science research? The name changes in stability in the Bacteria dorsal species complex have freed up fresh commodity trade in Asia and Africa. <clears throat> Excuse me. Support global harmonisation of fruit fly market access treatments, simplifies Australian border security, and has informed impact and risk analysis. Our initial strategic research on protein bait spray and fruit fly response to protein has been further tested and refined by at least two state agencies, and it's been incorporated into specific grower recommendations. The new diagnostics handbook will significantly improve border security and our opportunity to respond promptly in event and incursion. And while I absolutely hate the term, um, a mature female Q fly trap that works has the potential to be a game changer in fruit fly research, in fruit fly management. Next slide, please. So there are the outcomes and outputs. What about the science quality? All through the CRC work, the quality of the science that we've achieved has been very high. I estimate that approximately 40 refereed publications, nearly all um, Q1 journals, can be directly linked to CRC projects. And these include editorship of a special journal issue, the book chapters, and an annual review of entomology paper. The annual review event, for those entomologists in the room are well aware, is that um, our profession's peer number one journal um, for which you can only get publication through invitation. At one point, the Dorsalis project had three Web of Science highly cited, highly cited papers. And for papers published since 2010, 
and that's the first year that I can um, find a paper that we've directly attributed to CRC publication. And using the search term tephridity, the QUT lab is the most published lab in the Southern Hemisphere, and we're the most cited globally with 568 sites. So that's a reflection of how our peers um, are seeing the quality of science which have come out through CRC funding. And then this slide, um, which I'm particularly proud of, if I'd been there and had a chance to use fancy animation, it would have worked better. But it's the issue of capacity enhancement. So this is a photo of the lab taken a couple of years ago now. And essentially you can read down the side what's happened to those people. So Paul, who speaks after me, um, has moved to have a research leadership position at Big Agri Bio. Mark Schutz, who was initially a postdoc on the Dorsalis project, is now with Biosecurity Queensland. Solomon Balagawi, who was one of the first CRC funded postdocs in my lab, has an established position with New South Wales DPI. And even most recently, Talini Ekinyaki, uh, a PhD graduate of the lab, has taken up a position with North, as an entomologist with the Northern Territory DPI. Steve Cameron, um, who I didn't know before, a CRC project, at that stage he was working for CSIRO, was headhunted where he, to become um, where he is now the head of Department of Purdue Entomology. And for myself, um, I was still a fairly young post um, senior lecturer when I got my first CRC project. I'm now a recognised full professor. So the significant, very significant capacity enhancement to the general Australian biosecurity sector through CRC funding. Um, I also point out, um, we're actually there, Yuva and Boontop, um, sitting beside um, the insert photo of Solomon, um, international capacity enhancement. RAC came to us um, from the Thai Department of Agriculture. She's since returned to Thailand where she heads the Thai National Department of Agriculture's insect collection. Just before leaving that site, it's worth mentioning that movement of people through a lab is not without pain. Um, you build up, support people in their mentorship, um, they grow and they move on. As a lab leader, it's not easy, but it's an important part to remember what we do as particular as university laboratories. Our job is mentoring and training. International linkages. Through these CRC projects, we've made strong international linkages across the globe, which help to continue to inform and improve our capacity to deal with exotic fruit fly problems. And the photo on the, uh, I won't even say whether it's my left or your right, but in front of all the flags, it's a photo taken in 2010 in Vienna. It's in the headquarters of the International Atomic Energy Agency building at the Vienna International Center. And circled in green, Myself, Karen Armstrong, Mark Schutz, and Andrew Jessup. Andrew at that stage was on St. Conman in Vienna, but Karen, Mark, and I had paid ourselves to be at the table um, of the first meeting of an international project on Dorsalis. Circled in red are people who at that stage I couldn't, didn't know apart from a bar of soap, uh, Mark De Meyer and Massey Virgilio. And in the decade since that, well, eight years since that photo was taken, um, these people have now become close friends and colleagues, um, and they're the people who have been hosting me here in Brussels. So those linkages uh, with the international community are invaluable for preparing um, Australia's border biosecurity. In terms of leadership, what have we achieved? Well, the, the reason I'm over here instead of being in Melbourne, so I'm finishing um, a new textbook on fruit flies. Um, I can tell Michael, he'll be pleased to know, and Stuart Parsons, my head of department, who's in the audience, that as of yesterday, I have a contract with Cabby to publish it. Uh, it's effectively finished. We've written major review chapters and book chapters. The Dorsalis Synonymy paper, which was the primary outcome of that large Dorsalis project, was a paper of, with 49 authors from 16 countries and it was front-ended and back-ended by CRC-funded um, scientists. 
And then we produce the National Fruit Fly and RD&E Plan um, that will be Daryl will speak about directly following me. And so what's the future for the lab? Well, the CRC may be finishing, but the QUT Fruit Fly Group's not going anywhere. The continuity of 10 years worth of funding from the CRC has established the lab nationally and internationally, um, such that we have very high likelihood and indeed do have currently ongoing funding post the CRC. So I come back to this point that long-term investment in strategic research is highly valuable, both in what it delivers in the short term, but also what it delivers in the long term. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. So it's not Daryl, it's me on the Fruit Fly RD&E plan. Um, I, just, I don't know if Tony's still online, but I'd thank him for a couple of things. One, it's great to know that book is getting completed. Stuart and I are cheering. Uh, it's been a while coming, but I think it'll be a really important publication. The second thing to thank uh, Tony is the acknowledgement um, that he gave there about how the CRC management team plays a critical role in shaping and help um, construct projects, collaborative projects that have a real impact. So um, I'm going to talk about the why and the how of the National Fruit Fly rd &E Plan and this is a circumstance where uh, we felt and certainly I felt when I came to the CRC we had a bit of a gap in the system and I remember the very first horticulture advisory panel meeting where we were debating the pros and cons of a couple of fruit fly projects and we just, as a management team, we couldn't see the continuity or the integration through the projects and uh, me being very naive to bios, biosecurity and certainly the fruit fly world said, well, we can do something about that. We will take our national leadership and coordination role extremely seriously and we'll develop a national fruit fly rd &E plan. Well, it took a while to organise, but we got there in the end. So it was really obvious to me right from word go that we needed national coordination. When I started digging around, or we started digging around as a fairly new management team, we could see that that case for coordination and collaboration was pretty bloody clear. We'd had a national fruit fly strategy in 2008 and then an implementation plan in 2010, and they were sitting there from where I'm sitting. They were just sitting on the shelf doing nothing because nobody was really funding it, nobody was driving it. Nobody was championing and making it happen. Um, I think people got frustrated in the next couple of years that they developed a benefit cost analysis on the uh, action plan which said, gee, we really got to do this, it'd be really worthwhile. And then it just sat there. So we, ha we felt we had to really drive a, uh, the, the rd and &E component of those documents um, in order to get the commitment behind the research that would help uh, implement those. So. Uh, to address the need um, and simultaneously the Fruit Fly Strategy Advisory Committee was implemented in 2014 to Im implement those two plans. We took our role about national leadership and coordination seriously and uh, behind the scenes there was lots of discussions so that uh, ultimately Minister Joyce requested us, formally requested that we develop that Fruit Fly rd &E plan with the clear instructions about how it had to address outcomes to industry and that it would support the fruit fly strategy and its implementation plan through that advisory committee. So in doing that, the first thing we want to do is put together a writing team of experts to make this happen. Um, for us, it was obvious that uh, Tony Clark had to be involved. Um, he'd been a long time supporter of uh, good quality, high quality fruit fly research, as you saw. Phil Taylor from Macquarie Uni, Kim James, who was at that stage with HIA and Chair of our Horticulture Advisory Panel, Pat Barclay from the Citrus Industry, um, also on the HAP, Daryl Barber, who's talking next. At that stage, he was with DOOR and now with the Fruit Fly Council, and Joe Luck is our um, Research Leader Program Coordinator. I can't remember what role you were, Joe, at that point. Um, was an important part of this team. Uh, we delivered that plan, which was launched by Minister Joyce and delivered to the Fruit Fly Council within a year of uh, getting that instruction. Now, I really just want to touch on how it was structured. It was uh, identified the broad areas of RD&E, RD &E, and it was a plan to 
not just for the next couple of years. It was a plan that we knew we weren't going to implement the whole thing. We were only going to do bits. It wasn't a plan for us. It was a plan for Australia. It was planned for the next 20 years. The broad themes are there. Uh, and I think the important things that are note that the obvious ones, themes one to four, sit there. But there are the less obvious ones that we thought as a group were really um, critical to the success of the, uh, an Australian rd and &E fruit fly research plan. And there are social issues as associated with um, fruit fly in Australia. The capacity building aspects of that were in, in, really important for the next generation of technical capacity. And then some real core science themes. So they're all articulated in the plan. There were some key recommendations. I think there are about a dozen recommendations for how we should implement the plan. But every investment area had to be linked to an outcome. So I'm just going to show one more slide about what it all looked like. Don't want you to read this, of course. The point is, this is theme one, managing exotic risk. So each theme that had a clear overview. These were statements about the issues that we wanted to address for industry outcomes why we needed that. Uh, you'll see in the middle, oh yeah, apologies. You'll see in the middle here where it lined with the fruit fly strategy recommendations and the implementation strategies. Then in each theme, our sub themes, what was the need that the research had to address? So this was not science push, it was addressing a need. What was the outcome that we wanted from this research? What were the sort of outputs, the scientific tools, technologies, papers that we wanted? The direct alignment to those plans and then a whole series of investment areas. Essentially for the next 20 years we want research agencies to be able to put in uh, investment proposals against these particular uh, areas of investment. And it all can link up to, it can all can link up to the, uh, uh, the overall theme outcomes in an integrated way and we can do regular assessments of how we're tracking against the plan. And with that I will hand over to Daryl Barber as to how the Council's implementing. Thank you Michael. So I, I guess my perspective perhaps is a little different and it's probably really dangerous to um, directly contradict your former speaker. Um, as to what happened with the National Fruit Fly Strategy. When it was developed, I think it was a fantastic plan and still is. Um, but it sits on shelves perhaps because there's no buy-in and, and that impact becomes a big one. Um, within the realm of Plain Health Australia, where the National Fruit Fly Council is now hosted, um, we've been fortunate to drive a whole heap of activities. But when we look at a biosecurity bio system as a whole, how do we encourage that investment that Tony spoke about? In fact, many speakers over the course uh, of this symposium have spoken about. How do we get more money to do the right things? What are the right things? And I think that's where the National Fruit Fly rd &E plan really um, adds a, another piece to the puzzle. Of course, as we know, fruit fly management is actually really simple. You manage it on farm, deal with it in the pack house, get your fruit in a carton, you might have to cold treat it and ship it off to market. Piece of cake. Oh, but there's a few factors that sort of influence what goes on in field. Um, and I'm sure we've all got our own pet issue uh, on farm or from a research and development perspective. These all play a role. In fact, fruit fly management is a little bit tricky. And then I'll play to Tony Clark. What happens when the exotics get here? Spotted wing drosophila, um, sorry, I consider it a fruit fly. Is not a maggot by any other name, still a fruit fly. Oriental fruit fly. You know, two pests that our industries are absolutely petrified about, and probably for very good reason. Those will completely destroy the already complicated management systems we have in place. So fruit flies, they are, well, not a wicked problem. In management school, we get them wicked problems for it's intractable. And I don't believe that's true with fruit fly, but it is a complex problem. We have a lot of tools. We just need to bring them together better. And I know, other pests are difficult to control. Xylella, major issue, wide host range, shares a lot of that feature with a lot of the exotic fruit flies. But compared with a lot of the issues that we find in horticultural systems, are all in backyards. Peach leaf curl, for example, spray copper at the right time, it's not really an issue. Fruit fly moves. Fruit fly has multiple generations per season. If you don't stay on top of it, it becomes a major problem. 
The fact that it lives inside fruit, it's hard to get to. Um, you know, it, it's not one of the nice pests to deal with. And the picture there is of prickly pear and eradication, well not so much an eradication, but certainly a control program going on in Shepparton. These alternative host plants mean you're not managing a farm or a backyard, you need to manage the entire environment. We need everyone to play their part. So really the National Fruit Fly Council that I represent uh, and try and manage the best I can, uh, holds the visions that were espoused within the National Fruit Fly Strategy and the goal of the strategy. We don't want fruit fly to be a major problem to our producers and we want to be able to export our commodities. So as Michael's outlined, the RDNE plan itself had seven themes. Um, within that, a whopping 113 projects across 31 sub-themes. Now, that may be a lot, uh, but the bonus there within the plan is that it covers just about everything you could think you could devote R&D to. Whether it be exotics, whether it be the social sciences, uh, it's all in there somewhere. Where I think the value is, is the mandate for investment, and perhaps this is where we had some hiccups with the uh, National Fruit Fly Strategy. Here's some good stuff, we all know it makes sense, but what's the impact? And when we want to drive government investment in particular, we need to give them the story about why it's going to make a difference. And by having that in one place, uh, I think we've now got a fantastic document, and I don't say that just because I was on the writing group, uh, but a fantastic document to help make the case uh, for the continuing the fight against fruit fly. The prioritisation is another thing. With 113 projects, where do you start? Uh, and that's another nice aspect of the RDE and e plan, um, is we can all cast our own vision across it. Whether you have an interest in post-harvest disinfestation or otherwise, you can find the piece you need. And for governments and industry, they can see the breadth of activities that can be undertaken uh, and how long they're going to take to deliver. So the National Fruit Fly Council, many of you may not know of who we are. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot there. Um, we actually are one of the perhaps few committees uh, linked into government that brings together both industry and government and some of the research funders. Um, ideally here, we're not actually representing industries, we're representing regions. From Bowen, where fruit fly is endemic, essentially representing most of Queensland, um, through to areas like Renmark, pest-free, proud, and we're going to keep it that way. We've got plant health managers, we've got state-based researchers, as well as the Commonwealth engaged. And of course, the CRC and Hort Innovation is two of the major sources of funding. There's gaps, of course. We know there's ARCs and universities and other funders, but this is a start towards getting the entire community together to think about priorities and uh, how we best work as a team. So what are we looking at at the moment? Community engagement. I mean, it's fantastic to hear the theme that's come out of that uh, over the last sessions uh, and over the previous days. Um, communities are a host of fruit flies. Uh, and we need to manage them there. Um, Isabel's work I've been particularly uh, impressed with of how do you actually empower people to manage fruit fly? How do you say it can be done? Does it can. Uh, maintaining and improving pest freedoms. Of course, people have probably seen the media about Tasmania uh, and outbreaks in South Australia and Western Australia. Those freedoms we have, whether it's just freedom from Q fly or freedom from med fly or freedom from both, are really important to our long-term trade, uh, trade strategies. Tools and extensions. Again, we have the tools in the box. How do we use them best on farm? And again, the RDE plan helps, gives us some insight into those and areas we might like to invest in more. And I'll try not to steal anyone's thunder on that topic. And future treatments. What is the future? Once upon a time, methyl bromide was the, the be all and end all. Some countries don't like that so much anymore. Cold treatment, does it work? Irradiation, developing those options into the future. So with that bell and one minute to go, I'll say thank you very much for your attention. If you want to hear more about the Council, I'm more than happy to talk answers, but certainly I would commend this plan and a similar approach for other high-priority pests and complex problems across Australian and international biosecurity.